but I think we also want to take the time that Africa does not always get um, in, um, in conversations in, um, in any context, frankly. So um, I'm grateful that we have a special uh, session just about what's going on in Africa and how cultural work uh, reacts and interacts with cultural policy there. And we have a wonderful panel. Uh, and um, I want to begin with a couple of thoughts, so bear with me if you will. Um, I worked for 10 years, so I'm a latecomer, I'm hardly an Africa hand, um, but I worked in the region for 10 years. And my job now is with Sundance Institute East Africa, which is part of the Sundance Institute Theater Program. Many of you are familiar with the Sundance Institute Film Festival. But there is a theater side, and we are one of the few American uh, professional theater institutions that has any kind of international initiative, period, and um, that has the intensity and longevity of a 10-year program of internet interaction, exposure, and exchange with a region in Africa. Um, so as, without being uh, redundant for people who already know the obvious, Africa's a big continent. And there are over 50 countries. Uh, the, the individuals who are on this panel have worked and represent work about and in a few of the countries, but not a whole thing. Plus, um, there's a huge range of work in Africa, which surprises people. People are always asking me, really, they have theaters? Yes, they have theater buildings. Yes, they have a range of theater from uh, theater that we recognize as Western and theater that comes from African traditional performance theater that interacts with utilitarian uh, goals, such as education or, uh, or uh, other social change uh, imperatives. Uh, so there's a huge range of theater. There are Africans who are making a living doing theater. They have 700 people a night in their theaters or more. We were just in Ethiopia. Uh, one of our panelists is from Ethiopia. One of the guests in the house was from Ethiopia. And uh, there, it was 1,400 people and all young watching a play. There's a very young, excited uh, audience in Ethiopia. Uh, there are lots of questions that come up in any kind of interaction in Africa, especially for those of us who are not African. Um, and uh, those questions are imperative for us. We can't possibly work there without reflecting on them. And so the rigor of interaction in Africa is something that is constantly challenging. And it brings up many, many questions, both for the, us as cultural workers and for any kind of interactor, and certainly intervener, and certainly for the artists who work in Africa themselves. So what are some of those questions? Uh, there are questions about reciprocity and continuity, about compatibility of process and goals, and there are questions about assumptions that people bring, history, about the vocabulary we use, and uh, utilitarian use of art. So I'll just give a couple of personal into, into anecdotes before I turn it over to the audience. Um, one of the anecdotes I want to share is a conversation that I had um, with Ngugi Watyango, who is a wonderful, wonderful Kenyan uh, playwright, public intellectual artist, who is now based at the uh, University of California, Irvine, uh, and with his uh, writing and translation project. And he quoted to me uh, uh, something by Aimé Césaire, a great uh, African Martinique poet and political theorist who was part of inventing the negritude movement in Africa. And um, he paraphrased it, but I'll quote it, because I, I had to go look it up. It is a good thing to place different civilizations in contact with each other. That whatever its own particular genius may be, a civilization that withdraws into itself atrophies. That for civilizations, exchange is oxygen. All of the work that we do in, as part of Sundance Institute East Africa has certainly been oxygen for those of us from the United States and hopefully, and as I understand it, for those of our colleagues in Africa. But as Ngugi reminded us, because it was very important to him when he concluded the, the quote, as long, he said, as long as they are equal. And he put his fists together just like this. And that is something I've never forgotten, because certainly the exchanges in Africa have not always been in any way equal. 
Um, so the question of power, status, resources, constantly coming up. Another example I wanted to give was an a anecdote is that when I first arrived, I was introduced to Stephen Rongezi, who runs a dairy center in Uganda. And I was just being introduced to him by Philip Barnaud, who runs the Center for International Theater Development. He said, you should meet this gentleman. And I said hello to Stephen, and he said, oh, so you're doing a theater workshop. What are you going to teach in your theater workshop? <laughs> and I, fortunately, had uh, done my research. <laughs> research. And I said, yes, well, theater coming from the word theatron, which is the Greek and Latin meaning to see, meaning the theatron, the spectator space, meaning the invention of Greek, meaning Western theater. We're not doing a theater workshop. <laughs> and I knew, and I eventually have taught at um, Carey University's music, dance, and drama program, and the word he preferred was drama, because drama for him included all of African performance tradition. So um, vocabulary can, mm -hmm. can be so simple and so quickly a misunderstanding of basic assumptions. The other and last anecdote I want to share is a concept I've constantly referred to my mentor, Cynthia Cohen, from uh, Peace Building in the Arts and the Acting Together project, Do No Harm, a concept that definitely comes out of the, I know, peace building world and probably out of the, the public policy world as well. And one cannot spend any time in Africa without being reminded of the anecdote of how the Rwandan government used art in the creation of the genocide. Because it was the singers and the songs and the art and the posters and the language on the radio that ignited that genocide. So artists are not benign whether they are artists inside the country or whether they are artists who are doing some kind of visitor outsider status. So all sorts of problematic issues come up and um, I want to turn to our panelists now and um, I think they all are going to help us understand what is particular about Africa, uh, what is particular about the role of arts and policy in Africa, uh, I hope they'll tell us what is both problematic and what is successful about their exchanges. Um, and uh, the first people I would like to introduce are Ping Chong, who is one of America's leading theater artists, the artistic director of Ping Chong and Company, who has worked on his piece, Cry for Peace, Voices from uh, the Congo, and his collaborator, Carol Jojovsky. I studied Polish. Um, a university arts presenter at Syracuse University. Okay, we can roll the slide. Um, I'm not an expert on Africa, but um, I have a curious uh, fate with the Congo. Um, in, but I will start with uh, my relationship with Carol here, which is that in 2008, or 2007 rather, I was invited to work on a um, oral history documentary work about Syracuse, the city of Syracuse, and the people who live in Syracuse. And I've been working for 20 years with different communities across the country and internationally to give voice to marginalized communities in which they speak for themselves. So this is a story theater without actors. This is a story theater with members of the community speaking for themselves. So this was the first uh, relationship I had with Syracuse stage which is um, a child of Syracuse University. That's a good way to put it. It is. <laughs> um, but uh, in earlier, um, I worked on a piece um, I, on the Congo called Blindness, uh, the Irresistible Encounter uh, of Light. And uh, I was interested in the history of the Congo and the history of King Leopold in the Congo which is uh, a, a story that most of you probably know about already. And so, so I went and did research in Belgium. I did this project with Kent State as a, as a project for students to understand something about history as well as learning about theater. Um, so, what was I see the slides are going really slow. Um, I, can, I can see the head. Yeah, I just, because we have such a tight timeline. Um, so, I already had a background about uh, of knowledge
college about the Congo, and at the time when I did went to Belgium, met people, former colonialists, um, the Royal Con people, folks from the Royal Congolese Museum uh, in uh, Tiburon, outside of uh, Brussels. So I had also had hope to go to the Congo, but at the time people said you really need to have contacts to really go to the Congo, and what what you need to know is that. Um, the Congo, which is the size of Western Europe, has almost no roads in it. Uh, so contact is still down through the Congo River. Um, and then when I was got after uh, Tales from the Salt City, I was um, Syracuse stage, the drum trigger Syracuse stage of Kyle Bass said that um, a member of the Congolese community in Syracuse was interested in doing a Peace and Reconciliation Project, and Kyle said, since I had done Salt City, came to me and asked me if I was interested, and since I already had a great interest in the Congo, I came and I met with the community, and that's where Carol comes in. So, let me be really honest about our attention. We didn't create this piece or engage this project to affect public policy in the Congo or the U.S. We created it as a vehicle for change through the retelling of an astounding story of reconciliation. And that begins to open up for me a really interesting question about the difference between the desire to impact public policy compared with the power of peace and reconciliation projects, which actually might do that, right? So I feel like I've become an accidental diplomat. Um, what really became, started as an altruistic action on the part of Kyle to help this community find a way to tell their story to other Americans um, in, um, in their own way um, has opened up this amazing um, engagement with hundreds of people in surprising ways. Um, and we haven't even had the world premiere yet. So um, Kyle paired up with Ping, who he knew from his experience would make an elegant piece of haunting story theater. Um, but one of the most important reasons for pairing up with Ping is that we knew from seeing other undesirable elements pieces that Ping would not lose the links to the source of the story and that he, as an artist, is committed to a process that requires the storyteller to own their own story and their truth is told themselves on the stage and, and that they own the reaction of their own stories. So we have Cyprian who came to help. Um, um, he's have, the leader of the Congolese community. Right. An incredible, charismatic leader who knew that if he could find a way to tell a story through a lens um, that was more American and <coughs> from a um, theatrical point of view, he would have maybe a chance at um, showing something um, new that he could tell about this amazing uh, mission that this group has in Syracuse for reconciliation. Um, we have um, they came to me and asked me if I would commission, which I said, yes, I would. Um, I was lucky. I just stepped down after a 10-year deanship, and the chancellor had given me some sort of wedding present money um, in my new position as the university arts presenter. So I had some resource to be discretionary and to pick some projects that I thought would be sustainable over time and make real impact. And um, this fell into my lap five weeks after I said yes to this pro um, to this. Um, new position. So, um, and then we have a secret weapon at Syracuse. We have Nancy Cantor, mm -hmm. who many of you know as a public intellectual who speaks um, from a very deep place about the impact that the arts have on the possibility of changing the world and the mission that she has for Syracuse students to learn to be citizens of the world. So we have this amazing resource of leadership at the top who believes in this work and has um, proven that by giving us resource for projects like this. And this is only one of my five or six projects, by the way. So um, I, I think that universities may just be the last bastion of patrons of the arts and commissioning. So support at the top of the leadership ladder is pretty essential. Um, we are pretty lucky to have not just her passing notice, but public evidence of her deeply held values, and that drives us to do things that are a little bit beyond the ordinary. When I returned from the Congo last trip and recounted uh, some really scary stories, she just looked at me and said, I hear you, but you can handle this, and fear is the wrong reason for us to go out, of course. That's from my chancellor. Um, 
I think in the largest sense, Nancy probably does believe that public policy can be affected by the arts, but that really wasn't our initial reason for doing this. Um, it opens up this question that we're all talking about. What is public diplomacy and cultural diplomacy anyway? I'm still listening to hear that answer today. Um, and I'll clue you in, I don't have that answer, but I actually think I've done it. Um, but I don't know the answer to that question. The light like pornography. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Is it a process? Is it a theory? Is it a policy? Is it an outcome? And if it's an outcome, how do we know when we've achieved it? I really want to know that. Um, and what else are we looking for here? Are we trying to get our projects exposed? Is it about the performance? Is it about the process? You have to understand that for me, I have a particular lens. I'm in a university with a committed agenda of community engagement. And I'm struggling with these questions, and particularly in a university setting where my primary goal is to engage students' minds and hearts, hoping to inspire them. And then what happens with it? And how do we responsibly react and support them um, when they are inspired? And how do we incite them to action in a really, uh, in, in a really responsible way? I, I, I struggle with that. So now we have Kyle, and we have Ping, and we have... Cyprian, this <coughs> incredible, um, charismatic presence, and um, we're, uh, we go to the Congo. We, just, <laughs> we decide that, um, because Cyprian, this is where, why does this react, what, what has this got to do with Africa? Cyprian, from the very moment he entered this conversation, told us that his dream was to take the story back to Goma, to take it back to the, 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 the um, country where he was born and that he loves, and he wanted a way to do that in an elegant way. So we're still trying to figure out, how do we do that? Um, if you, um, I, I'd love to know, like, let's have a show of hands, how many of you are going to pay me tuition mm -hmm. to send your children <laughs> with me to Goma on the eastern edge of the Congo? Okay, I'll take your money, sir. <laughs> <laughs> right. So that's that. You know, we still have the issues of in loco parentis and the perception that we we have to responsibly care for those students that are under our tutelage. And I'm looking for a way to find a way to be able to bring this back to Africa on behalf of this Congolese community, um, remembering that they can't go with us; they're refugees. And so we also then have our secret weapon of Ping and Kyle, who hopefully will help us do a narrative project that will draw out stories. <laughs> That's Kyle. And there's Ping, yeah. Um, let me just look at my time, because, okay, I've got half a minute. Um, <laughs> I want to tell you something really exciting. About a month ago, Nancy Cantor and our provost, Eric Spina, announced that Cry for Peace would be the freshman experience for Syracuse University students. That means that 3,500 undergraduates will be required to go to see Cry for Peace, Voices of the Congo. In September. In September of this coming year. We'll spend the summer putting together electronic references for them to help them become, give them a context for this experience. There are people in this community that think this is crazy, that this is way too difficult information for 17-year-olds, that it's too um, difficult. But, you know, we all know what they watch on television, right? <laughs> and we also have um, a, a stated mission to actually bring it back to, back to our locale. I would say that everything that is told in our piece, which there are difficult, difficult stories, that if you walk seven blocks from the university into some of the hardest neighborhoods of Syracuse, upstate New York, in a pretty protected place, every single one of the issues that we bring up is <coughs> on the streets, right in our area. So we'll take it from the abstract, a place where they can say, oh, isn't that horrible that that happens in the Congo, and hopefully find a way to turn it around. In the meantime, we'll also be um, looking for projects that we hope will help engage those few really, engage in an important way students who become inspired to incite to action. We'll find a way to support them in projects over the course of the semester and the year. So we have a pretty <laughs> ballsy agenda, I think. And, um, but again, we have some amazing support 
Um, I do want to really, really quickly also say that we're really grateful to Ping Chong um, and the Ping Chong companies. They've invited Cry for Peace to be part of um, Pink's 25th um, Desirable Elements uh, Festival. 20th. 20th. <laughs> uh, um, Undesirable Elements in, uh, at October. La Mama, in October at La Mama Theater in New York. This will give us a chance to see if we can tour this. But, but I should mention that when we do it in October, we just deliberately connected it with Congo Week, which is October, right. which is to raise consciousness about what's going on in the Congo. And so there's a whole bunch of events going on in October and has been going on for some time. This is partly in relationship to an organization that's here in Washington called Friends of the Congo. Right. So they'll be involved in this as well. I have three minutes left and I have a three minute video. I'd like to just introduce this by saying that um, we were um, really gratified to be invited by Derek and by Cynthia in September of 2011 to come to Georgetown to present uh, a, a workshop, uh, work in progress. Uh, Cynthia uh, moderated a, a panel at Talkback, sorry. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we had a, an amazing experience. And one of our students from the Newhouse School came with us and did the short video that we're using for some of our promotions. So I'd like you to see that. You'll get to meet some of the uh, cast members um, through this video. So can you run that? Prevalent in the making of this piece. We, we, um, you were told really yeah, we were told not to name any tribes in our story storytelling, which was a challenge. Sure. Right. You know, which was a challenge. So, uh, so yes. the, the folks in the piece were not professional actors. No, they're, no, they're, they're their stories. They're, yeah, okay. they're never professional actors unless they happen to be. I mean, if they're, they're telling their stories, but if they happen to be, that's that's just part of the thing. But it's not we. The whole point of the show is is about real people telling their own stories. But and he told through his words, so so it's so, to be processed. So here's the question: um, Why wouldn't you do? Why wouldn't you actually give the show to to some some entity or organization in the Congo and let them do it there? We're As working a, on that. Okay, so right. but you were talking about the issue of bringing people from. Well, that was that initially uh, when we first started the project. The idea was we could bring these people there right. and do the show, right. tell their story. Right. But you know, but then we realized that wasn't really real. When yeah. we do the world premiere in the fall, the local PBS station is going to film it, so we'll have um, a, a, and and uh, retell it on five stations, maybe more. Um, we'll have that then that we'll be able to use in that way, so that we can use the specific piece and not have to rework it. But I think it's an opportunity, it's a template for the kind of work that students, young people um, can do um, around narrative projects that draw out stories and call attention to big issues. I think that's why I'm still looking for a way for Syracuse students to be able to do that, because it, I think it's a template. But I should just mention one last thing, which is that um, it's, it's, it's also a very low budget project, so it's very possible yeah. to do it. It can be done in a big the theater. We've <laughs> done it in 700 seat theaters and it's worked. Mm -hmm. We've done it in a beauty parlor, in a community center. So it's totally flexible, right. which is the beauty of it. And have you found that the reconciliation among the Congolese community that you described when you were here in September, which was so great, but is that continuing? Is that enduring? The, well, the impact well, of this process. Well, we're we're in we're in a hiatus right now, so we haven't really continued the project yet. Well, we have so, uh, at, at the university. I mean, we in have terms of, been yeah. in, in uh, conversation with uh, with Cyprian, the leader of that community, with other members. I've done speaking engagements, bringing in other uh, members of the community, not just Cyprian, but some of the other people, and um, that's been it's been interesting to see. Um, a different lens when you start to dig deeper into that community and have more access to that community and they start to trust you more to help um, with some of those activities that the story um, as the book changes. Um, I, think it's, I think it's, yes, I think that's the... Because that was one of the most striking things to me when you talked about how yep. the process of doing this had brought those two right. to see the different um, sectarian or whatever you want to call them right. just <coughs> together and there was also some talk about potentially uh, about the impact of that on their relatives and friends back in the Congo that right. was having an amazing ripple effect. Is that still true? That's the stories that we hear. So 
So I'm sorry, I'm going to move us along, and I know there are many questions for both Pain and Carol, and I hope that you will take advantage of the opportunities to speak about them further. Um, I just want to say that in the minus list of the challenges, there's these things that just came up in the plus list. <coughs> Amplifying local voices. And these are goals of the public policy world. These are not art boys goals, necessarily. But they certainly are the, the goals of the Ford Foundation, the goals of Open Society, the goals of the U.S. State Department. Amplifying local voices. Spaces for uh, creating context for uh, public dialogue. Global citizenship. And um, a personal note, who tells their own story? It's a question that are in the public policy discussion, and we're hearing them reflected by the work of these artists. Um, so the next person I would like to turn to to introduce is uh, Dee Soyini Madison. She's the chair of the Department of Performance Studies and director of oral history and performance as social action with the program of African Studies at Northwestern University. Thank you. I am thrilled to follow your presentation, um, because it helps explain my own. Um, I, I am also uh, on faculty with the Department of Anthropology, and I only mention that to say that my work is really grounded in you know, what we know as performance ethnography. So I see my theater practice as uh, inseparable from field work data. Um, so my work in Ghana was really, um, it was a 10-year process, was really um, understanding the work of local human rights activists and how they employ performance tactics as a means of changing interventions upon enlightening their own communities around issues of human rights <coughs> and human rights abuses. And then, um, as a teacher, I see my students um, as my kind of theater company, all right? Uh, and I see my performance work as a kind of performance pedagogy, as well as that work that entails a kind of social scientific methodology around field work. But um, how we then take those verbatim stories, all right, uh, from local activists, and then that falls within the rubric that I think is very important in the global south around issues of representation. We've seen those representations where you've got either torture porn or poverty porn, but we don't see those kind of local agents who are hidden, whether they're hidden in villages or their voices are just silenced, whether it be on a panel, whether it be in, in their own home places, wherever, but the courageous kind of eloquence um, at which they make, they put their bodies on the line. And we would never know who they are, all right? But this kind of work and the kind of work that we're all involved in here in terms of excavating that work and using the power and alchemy of theater to theatricalize that, to put it in a frame, and then put it within a public space, um, is not only impactful of a kind of awareness of policy within local communities that awakens the attention of, of government officials and so on and so forth, but can start a social movement. I really believe that. Um, and I also want to talk about how um, local activism, when, um, is when it is artistically framed, um, what the kind of purpose and vision of that kind of work is. And um, I do believe that there is uh, this kind of individual, empathic meeting of my students with um, uh, local activists that they may not know or ever meet. But I also want to say that that work also for me and for many of my students, and I think for many of us, and what I'm hearing in this room, does begin at the political. That, that there's some of us, it's hard for us to kind of shed our vulgar Marxism, maybe, you know, and it's hard for us to kind of shed, you know, the, 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 the romanticism of agitprop theater. Uh, and, and instrumentality is not necessarily such a bad word, all right? But it reminds me of, um, 
Toni Morrison's phrase when she said, art must be political, but it must be irrevocably beautiful at the same time. Or it falls off as harangue at one level and pornography at the other level. So I see them, you know, as, as one informing in this kind of wonderful reciprocal way the other. So we ended up uh, from this field work in Ghana doing two shows, and please time me, I've got, I don't want to go over my five minutes. Okay. Um, doing two, <laughs> on speed dial here, doing two shows. One uh, was called Is It a Human Being or a Girl? And the other was called Water Rise. And Is It a Human Being or a Girl? were the uh, narratives and oral histories of local activists who were intervening on a cultural practice where women were basically sent into shrines as concubines for shrine priests. Well, many, many felt that this was absolutely a human rights abuse, all right? And it was. But as I spent more time, I realized that this practice and the courageous and eloquent ways that, that activists were changing this practice, there was another contingency, and that had to do with poverty. And I didn't, I don't want to go into this whole discourse of globalization and political economy and neoliberalism. I really, you know, want to be an artist, right? But it could not be avoided. And my body, in that presence, while all of this was going on, implicated my own country. So there was a connection between human rights discourse and human rights practice and abuses with American foreign policy. Rice being dumped in the north, which means local farmers, you know, could not afford to plant their goods and sell it. Concerns around fair trade, all of that, you know, may be a long distance relationship to issues of human rights, but I found out that However small or distant the village is, there's a, there's a correlation between human rights and poverty. I wanted to figure out what that was in this performance, all right, and make a beautiful rhetorical narrative about that. Um, the, other, the other project was a project called Water Rights, R-I-T-E-S, all right. And uh, the stories there around water democracy and the activists who were concerned around how resources, uh, water resources are being used was, was quite fascinating. But then again, I felt, wow, transnational corporations, what is this happening? Again, it's this, this, this very difficult and complex partnership around economic forces, human rights, and art, and how to merge that so you have this beautiful performance, but that this beautiful performance also does something, and it also questions our own policies, all right, um, uh, and our own kind of burdens around what we must do uh, in countries where uh, some, where much of, of what we do and what we don't know about what we do impacts a very small story. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, just a couple things that um, hit me once again that are that are not necessarily your goal but are but are the positives of this kind of work. You're supporting agency and therefore human capacity building. You're supporting the local conversation. You're you're recognizing the the paradox of instrumentality. Uh, and you're also talking about work that recognizes complexity rather than providing simple answers to complex situations. Um, uh, and now I would like to introduce uh, Belaine Abune, who is a professor of theater at Addis Ababa University. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> hello, everybody. First, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers uh, of this conference and uh, particularly Ms. Roberta Levitov uh, was inviting me to, to um, share my experience um, on the opportunities and challenges, uh, specifically um, on the actual intersection between the arts and the public policy in Ethiopia. Uh, first, I would like to um, underline one point. Um, because uh, most people think that uh, when they uh, 
tech African theater. Uh, they think that African theater is the same and uh, they put it in one vessel, which is completely uh, wrong. Because uh, Ethiopia is different from other African countries in many ways. One, historically, um, uh, Ethiopia is different uh, because uh, Ethiopia has remained independent. Uh, she's not colonized uh, and remained independent for so many years, while other African countries have been colonized by European powers. That makes it different, and it also uh, uh, informs the Ethiopian tradition in its own way. The other is um, the alphabet, our own unique alphabet. We have um, our own language, national language, which uh, we use officially to, to, to uh, teach education in um, high schools, uh, also in some universities, also the, the medium of instruction is English at the university level, but mostly we work in Amharic language. And the most of our theater practices is done in that language, which has its own alphabet, unlike other African countries. So this, in a way, um, uh, makes it difficult for foreigners to really to understand the tradition, the theater tradition of Ethiopia, because mostly it's done in that native language and it's not published. Otherwise, we have uh, really a, a long theater tradition, uh, uh, mostly really going in the direction of Western theater, because our um, modern education has started within the line of the, the, the Western education form. Topia has a long cultural diplomatic relation with the United States of America for so many years. Even our, our library, the big library in the Asaba University is called Kennedy Library. Uh, unfortunately, in the um, 1970s, when this revolution has begun, then the country completely shifted towards the Eastern Bloc, okay, which the military, um, which has taken the power. Actually, the revolution was started by students to really, uh, because they were fed up with the long tradition of monarchical system, and they were longing for to have democracy in Ethiopia. Unfortunately, the military region of the time took the power, and then declared socialism as its own ideology. And completely then the artistic practice completely shifted toward this agio or law to this kind of agitating prop, um, I mean, propagating the socialist ideology to the people. So the theater, every theater was ordered by the government. To, to really uh, do a kind of uh, straight, straight um, kind of, uh, you can say, sermon, sermonizing the people. That is no artistic value in it. Um, at that time, I was, this I can relate with my experience, because was, at that time I was um, a, a, a student of the university, the theater department at the same university. Uh, and I was part of, of that movement, that uprising, a political uprising, which uh, we are no longing to have democracy established in our country. So unfortunately, as I told you earlier, the military region took power and suppressed any voices, any voices, and even in prison, maybe some of you maybe might have heard about this red terror, which is which, which, uh, uh, mass discrimination, which killed so many users at the time. Uh, so um, the paradox was when the public theaters run by the government, we have 
around five or six big theaters run by the government. So all of them were staging this agit pop theater. And uh, the government officials, the government employees, sorry, the government employees were ordered, ordered to see those performances. Otherwise, they were labeled as anti-government, anti-revolution, something like that. So at that time, paradoxically, our department was free. And we were uh, doing, because most of uh, our staff were foreigners, coming from uh, South Africa, Britain, and other African countries as well. So we were producing plays that have the contents of this Pan-Africanism, as well as place that dealt with apartheid system. This was done for two things. One, we were obliged. I mean, we feel that our country is the city of this African Union, and we are really, as Ethiopians, we are helping other African countries to be liberated from colonization. So we are obliged to voice okay, the injustices, the evils in those countries. On the other hand, it was a kind of an outrage for us to voice because we couldn't do, I mean, we couldn't object, I mean, the, 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 the injustices then in our country at that time. So it's a kind of an outrage for us to do those production dealing with this apartheid and um, uh, uh, Pan-Africanism. Anyway, um, <clears throat> after um, the fall of the Delhi region, then the new uh, government came into power, I mean, defeating uh, the military region after uh, fighting for 17 years. And, uh, well, so what is the situation like? Has it changed for good? Well, for me, uh, it's difficult to say because the, 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 the culture of fear and the culture of silence that has been uh, there for so many years is still there. Still there. It's difficult um, for artists to do any kind of play or to mount any kind of play dealing with political issues. There is a kind of human right abuses that's going on. There is a ethnic conflict that has been going on in the country. And uh, as our friend from Baghdad uh, said, most of the, the, the public theaters are, have been engaged with commercial and law theater for the public. Nobody is allowed. I mean, yes, there is no uh, kind of pre-censorship like the military region, but there is post-censorship. Mm -hmm. There are plays, but automatically. And also there is self-censorship, in a way. Okay? Apart from that, our university, uh, the department, our theater department has been engaged with, um, okay, doing uh, with theater for development activities, okay? Uh, in that area, our department has, which is different from that, this agit pop place, because one, it's done <coughs> through research, by going into the people. Two, it doesn't give any solution. It doesn't uh, try to, 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 to teach or educate the people. It just um, kind of microscopic the problem to the people and to discuss on the solution. So in that area, our department has done so many production in the areas of um, uh, gender inequality, corruption, uh, a kind of health issue, HIV AIDS, um, street children, the problem of street children, so many things. But the problem is, that the, our department is unable to, to take this production to the people. One, lack of time, because the students have to, to go to their relatives, 
during the vacation time. Second, there is lack of budget. And uh, third, no call related with the budget transportation, transportation problem. So this production, which really took us five, six months to produce, simply evaporated. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. The other, okay. The last thing which I want to mention is uh, the opportunities that we have had uh, last April. Um, that for the first time, the American Theatre Group, the Sundance Theatre Institute, came to Addis Ababa to, to uh, conduct uh, a state director's workshop, which is led by Roberta and her staff. And they stayed for one week, and we had a fruitful discussion with uh, our department staff and students. And even they even go. Um, Further to help us by talking with the American ambassador to continue this relationship with Sundance Theatre Institute, American Arts, and other departments. Thank, Thank you very much, Melania. Um, obviously, as a scholar of Ethiopian theatre and has a great deal more to say, hold on just a second, Abraham, um, another professor from Addis Ababa University. I just wanted to say that, yes, we did meet with the U.S. Embassy. And we were the first professional American theater artists to visit Ethiopia in over a decade. And the U.S. Embassy is very interested in facilitating. So what is the gap then? You have to ask yourself, where's the big gap? If, the, if, if uh, Ethiopia has been so isolated and there's an interest in, in breaking back down that isolation, uh, What's not happening to make that possible? We really, in some sense, it was coincidental that we ended up there. It was not with some sort of uh, larger dip uh, cultural diplomacy goal. Ibrahim, really quickly, and then we'll go on. Yeah, um, I just want to say a few words uh, about the current situation in Ethiopia. Since 1991, we have ethnic politics as an official base of the politics in the country. Ethnicity has become the basis of politics. So this base, this base, it is you cannot officially speak of the national identity of Ethiopia. I'm going to give you a living example myself. I used to be a lecturer and a researcher in Ethiopian literature and folklore department, as well as head of the department. I told you I used to be because I have been dismissed of my duties and rights in the department at the university because simply I wrote in protesting against ethnicization of academics in the university. They closed our department, the multi-ethnic, the multi-national department of Ethiopian literature and folklore was closed. Instead, they erected three ethnic based Departments, departments of Amharic language and literature, departments of Tigrinya language and literature, department of Oromo language and literature. In Ethiopia, we have more than 80 or 89 ethnic groups, languages, and cultures and folklore. Our department used to study, to deal with all the multinational cultures and folklore and literary heritage, the long, the rich literary heritage of country. Now they closed it. And I protested, I wrote a letter in protest of closing this department to the upper and the lower parliament, to the government. Mm -hmm. I did this just a day before I came to, I made that present paper in American Comparative Literature Association Conference in Providence. As a result, I was dismissed while I was here. So, what is worse, now I cannot go back to Ethiopia because definitely they will put me in jail. This thank is the situation. You. Thank you, Abraham. I know that there, there's, thank you for speaking openly, Abraham and Delaney. I know it's very difficult having been in Ethiopia recently, and, and that at great personal risk, you are here with us, and we, and we so appreciate that. And of course, it just bears mentioning that the Ethiopian community here in Washington, D.C. is probably one of the larger. Uh, and we would like to. So uh, I hope more conversation will happen about the Ethiopian community here in Washington, D.C., and the situation in Ethiopia now. And uh, now I would like to.
turn to Dr. Daniel Banks, who is my colleague, is co-director of DNA with Dr. is also co-director of DNA Works, and uh, faculty of MA in Applied Theater at City, City University of New York. Okay. And I'm just going to ask that anyone who is willing and or able would like to stand up for a moment, so please stand. <laughs> And just take your arms, palms up, breathing in, and then same thing, palms up, going down. Just notice we have bodies in this room, there's stories, there's trauma, there's memory, there's language, there's history. One more time, palms up, breathing down, and focusing on your own self, your own story, your own body, and down. I just want to pose this question. What would you like to say to the world? What would you like to say to the world? This was the question that was asked for seven weeks in a row of 30 different youth uh, in the Budaburam refugee camp in Ghana, made up primarily of Liberian refugees, um, from 10 different schools, three different youth each week. Um, and you can sit down now, please. Or oh, you can stand if you like. Uh, I'm going to keep standing because I can't think of it. So. Um, and uh, it was a workshop that my students and I led. Uh, I, I brought a group of 10 students from NYU to the NYU and Donna program in 2006, and we were joined by 10 students. Uh, from the University of Ghana. We uh, did this collaborative workshop. We were invited into the refugee camp to do this collaborative workshop. I want to say, first of all, that, um, that in my work, I, I tend almost always to only go where I'm invited. I don't attempt to bring the work in to any place other than somebody who feels that it's right for their community. Um, I also I have all these notes of things to remember to say. Um, I also want to say that um, that within this, this realm of applied theater or of applied arts or of um, working with youth or working in communities, I really try to avoid language of helping or empowering. Um, you know, these are, they're across the world, there are complex um, systems of signs and languages and expression. Uh, um, People's voices uh, sometimes get suppressed, but sometimes they choose not to use them because of politics or um, whatever. So we really focus on just creating opportunities for self-expression and leadership. So, I, so to me, events are about giving people opportunity for self-expression and leadership. And, um, and I do that whether I'm working on an ensemble piece with professional actors or whether I'm working in this refugee camp. And, uh, um, and you know we all we all have our own language to describe it. So I'm certainly not um, distancing someone else's language. I'm just talking about the language that I feel comfortable with as someone who has, off, as as a youth, was on the receiving end of a lot of well-intentioned work, and, um, and and the ways and and the times in which I felt comfortable using my voice, or the times that I chose not to use my voice because of the the, the environment that was created. So um, I'm, I'm in no way uh, um, taking anyone on. Um, so the, um, there is this question of collecting that JJ brought up yesterday, and I think I also um, talked a little bit about it, uh, my own discomfort with photographs and documentation of the article in, in theater topics. That being said, it is one way to communicate something to a gathering like this. So I do have a slideshow of photos so you can get an image of what it looked like to be in Budaburam. If you'd like to play the um, uh, Budaburam slideshow movie, please, that would be great. Let's see if it's not the, yeah, the slideshow, perfect. Hopefully it'll work with the new format. You can just play it and it'll run. Um, hopefully. So the Budaburam refugee camp is um, 25 square miles. It has 55,000 inhabitants. Actually, it doesn't exist anymore as a refugee camp. It, um, it was decommissioned by the UNHCR a few years ago. Uh, when we arrived there, and again, we were invited in, um, there were uh, murders of young children happening, um, and they were murdered in such a way that which ethnic group they were from, they could not be buried by, by their own particular ethnic group. So that meant that people from Liberia were either commissioning people in Ghana or sending people to Ghana, um, also to kidnap uh, children. There was still, even though the war was supposedly over and repatriation
repatriation was happening. You'll see some repatriation posters in the background. Um, there were still, uh, um, uh, what's it called? Not consequences, but th things were being done um, to avenge certain families' <coughs> behaviors in the war or protests or whatever. So we walked into this environment where young people were profoundly unsafe. And, um, and, and, and I won't tell you about the full the workshop, because uh, that's actually in the Acting Together anthology that um, Brandeis uh, and Cynthia Cohen put together with colleagues. Um, but uh, I, 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 this question, um, what did you, what, what would you like to save the world, was uh, produced some very interesting musical hooks, such as we're all one people, no matter where we come from, no matter where we are. Um, I mentioned that the refugee camp was uh, uh, partially Liberian, mostly Liberian, but there were also refugees from Togo and other parts of uh, the African continent in that camp. And um, another uh, beautiful sun hook that they put together was Liberian brothers, Liberian sisters, let's come together and find a better future. Um, this was all pretty much on the eve of forced repatriation back to Liberia. Um, what I want to focus on I, uh, I want to focus on um, Roberta's questions, which were about a positive, you know, a positive side to doing this kind of work, a negative side to doing this work, and then I have a, a, a sort of a, a lingering thought after that. Um, the positive side, absolutely, and I'm sorry I didn't catch the photo, but you may have seen a picture of four young women standing, working together. The tallest of the women who looked like she was taking leadership, her name is Lydia. Um, as soon as we uh, um, left Ghana, she began to email my students and I, asking us for money to help her finish her schooling. Because even though they were in a refugee camp, they still had to pay for uniforms and books and etc. Um, meanwhile, they are not, they have no official status in Ghana. They are not allowed to work in Ghana officially. Um, they have to pay to be in the refugee camp. They have to build their own houses. They have to, um, so it's a double bind. And this is with the blessing of the UN. Um, so, and, and, and as I mentioned, the camp is no longer there. A lot of people have been repatriated back to Liberia, but not everybody. There's still quite a few people living on that land, um, but it no longer has refugee camp status. They have even less resources than they had um, when they first uh, arrived. Uh, Lydia in, uh, kept very beautifully, she was, she, was, she was the only, not the only student, several students decided they were going to break the rules, and instead of only coming once for three hours, she came every every Friday for three hours, even though other people from her school were supposed to be coming in her place. They did come, but she just kept coming. And, and you know, we eventually realized that, that at the refugee camp, there wasn't a lot for them to do, so we encouraged people to come. So our, you know, the, our workshop of 25 or 30 people would often be 50, and then the young children came, and then we brought a student from NYU to come and do activities outdoors with the young children after we all warmed up together. Everyone's welcome. There's always room for everybody. We are have infinite flexibility and capability of, of, of responding to, to anyone who comes comes to us. So um, what ended up happening was we did, you know, after talking about it amongst ourselves, we decided that we were going to send her the money that she asked for. We recognized her leadership. You know, these were NYU students. They were not all from means, but they did recognize the privilege that they had of being at NYU, and we scraped, we scraped it together. We sent her the money. She eventually graduated. She was repatriated back to um, Liberia, and she and another, co and another, uh, actually one of the leaders from the organization that brought us in in Monrovia created a youth safe house for because, as you may have read in the newspaper, when Ellen Sterling so that Johnson took over, there was only one electric light bulb in Monrovia on, a, on a, one street light. Um, that was it. Uh, still, you know, the, the country was still in ruins. And they created this safe house where students could go after school, do their homework, use the arts as a form of self-expression, use the arts as a form of coming together and being safe. And, um, and one of my students, and two of my students, created an NGO to fund that fund that youth safe house with their help. And then Alfred and Lydia decided they wanted to have leadership of it entirely on their own. So my students, being my students, said absolutely and transferred the, the NGO to them. And they are now self-funded, self-run, self and, and, um, and uh, Prentice and Danielle have now funded another, uh, founded another NGO to help youth around the African continent called Asking International. So one of the positive sides was that um, that this could uh, this could have a life of its own and take off, and really the mission of leadership and self-expression could could continue. One of the um, I would say the negatives is that uh, 
we, we really had no capacity as a, as a group of artists of addressing the relationship of these refugees to, get to larger Guinean society. And we weren't there long enough to actually do that. Um, and so, and then, and then also we, we haven't been able to in any way contribute to those who have been left behind. We've sent books from the NYU library that were discarded, I mean these little gestures, but no real sustainable action. And so my lingering question is, it's, it's clear to me, and I'm going to just show a quick video clip, that we provided relief and hope in the moment, in that environment. Um, it's also clear to me that we didn't know how to do something more long term than that, but how do I balance my, as, a, as an artist working in these areas, how do I balance my concern for sustainability with incremental moments of self-efficacy that, that, that happen both for my students and for the youth in the refugee camp. And, and, and we do know some stories, some wonderful success stories that have happened on. There may be more. And what I really want to show you now is a quick video clip. This is the Sabiqwa. Um, it'll only be about two minutes in. When you get to the interview, we can cut off. This is in um, the East Rand in South Africa, which is an equally poor and destitute environment, where we did a three-day workshop with the Sibiqua um, Community Theater, which is the oldest community theater existing in South Africa, um, with youth, with, po with two, this is just a small composition which shows you the, the form of work that we do, with two poets and two women um, from this community theater. And it was performed for a group called Youth Against Violence, who were um, formerly incarcerated youth who had come together so as not to have recidivism. Um, I'm showing you this because I want to show, it was something that Carol, you referred to, I want to show, oh, that's my time. I want to show, it's a minute long. I want to show the, um, the moment. Right, what happens in the moment? I understand about sustainability and the need for deliverables and all of that stuff, but what about what happens in the moment? Please, thank you. Self-scripted, self-directed, um, ensemble, the device, theater. <laughs>
I am. I don't consider myself an activist really any longer, except that I continue to follow at a distance. And frankly, that's because I felt eventually you must spend time living in the region or in the country or in whatever piece of the world you're interested in uh, if you're going to continue to be an expert. And I didn't see an opportunity to do that, so I, I sort of backed out of that, and now I'm an old Africanist. Uh, but uh, the other thing is I have, uh, I've been in the policy world, uh, probably spent about 13 years in government when I, when I haven't been in the academy. And so, and I'm not in the theater world except that my husband and I have tickets to the major theaters around town and when I can get away in the evenings we go. Uh, but I just wanted to say a couple of thoughts and maybe I can do it from the point of view of somebody who's been at the policy level. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, let me just say that I have always, I have always thought and continue to think that the arts, and I'm not just talking about theater, I'm talking about poetry and literature and music and sculpture and textiles in Africa are very important elements in intercultural communication. And that that communication is important, in my view, for, and it's not a view I think that may be widely shared, uh, but it's very important for, for policymakers for two reasons, and I think you've touched on one of them maybe. One is the instrumental reason. The instrumental reason being that if you can understand in some depth in some profound way, the peoples that you're dealing with, then you can engage them in ways that are more effective, both for you and for them. Uh, and I don't think that happens very often in, amongst policy officials. Uh, I don't think it happens very often because that's not the way they're trained. Maybe this is beginning to change now, but I often have been tempted to ask people, American diplomats serving in Africa or Latin America, or anywhere. How long have you lived in a region? How long have you been associated with a region? But not as a diplomat or a representative of a large institution, but on your own. Because when you're on your own, you are exposed in a way that you are not when you're when you're protected by an, an outside institution. And that's, it seems to me, from my experience, how you really learn. Uh, if it's language, if it's culture, if it's if it's day-to-day -day norms of behavior, that seems to me to be uh, essential. And I don't think that, that happens all that much. Now, Cynthia, you may, you may disagree, but that certainly was my experience. It, it even is a problem here in Washington, D.C., because in my experience, again, if you've spent your life in the Department of State as a diplomat, you probably never spent any time on Capitol Hill. And they're about as far apart as Africa and the United States. <laughs> I mean, different cultures, you know, it's tribal, it's the whole thing. I, I spent time on both sides, so I can tell you. And I can see people sometimes talking like this, uh, but it's much, it's much more dramatic. So there's a, it seems to me there's an instrumental uh, basis for knowing people. I have to tell you a story or two. My first, uh, or my most uh, impressive experience, by the way, with African theater was in the bush. It was in a village in Malawi. And some of you may know about the theater company. I think it's a university or college theater company in Malawi that goes around and, and presents... Uh, plays in the villages. They stay in the villages for a few days, learn what's going on in the villages, what are people talking about, and then in the local language, in this case Chichewa, uh, presented a play. And it was it was such a it was such a sight. It was such a, a place to be uh, because the village arranged itself. Arranged itself. You could see the norms and values just in the way they arranged themselves around the central area where this play was taking place. And then the play was about sexual harassment. I guess that had been a big issue in the village. But it was, it was very effective. It was effective for me as an outsider, not even understanding the language, just to see how it was done, the interaction, the wonderful engagement of the villagers. I mean, this was live for them. But anyway, uh, that's, that's almost instrumental. But I think there's something more important, in my view, about, about understanding uh, other peoples through their theater, through their literature, whatever. And that is, you can call it empathy. You've talked a little bit about how you want your students to be have the sense of being in one world and when you can see and learn and know other people, if not by living with them, at least in their in their expressions of themselves, with their voices, with their theatrical performances and so on. It's a way of creating that understanding, that empathy. I think there's something even more fundamental, and that's an aesthetic uh, 
appreciation of the value of other people's wisdom and experience and knowledge and their ability to express themselves in a whole range of media. media. Uh, and uh, you know, I certainly found that in Africa. Uh, I found that in other parts of the world. I spent a year living in Latin America and I spent a good bit of time in the Middle East. Uh, that's one of the joys of being an international person or a person who travels. Most of us are becoming international these days. But to stop and listen and see and engage. Uh, I always try to seek out uh, the, if not the theater, because that's not so easy sometimes, but the, uh, the poetry or the literature of, of the places where I'm going. I, I, at one point, did this for somebody whose name you'll recognize. Years ago, uh, I traveled to India when I was in government. I traveled to India and all of South Asia with Secretary Clinton when she was First Lady. And I remember, you, well, the CIA puts together all these briefing books, and they couldn't be more boring or irrelevant, frankly. I think you get much better briefings in my experience. Pardon me if anybody's here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you can get better from the Economist Intelligence Unit. But what is always, always absent from these books, in my experience, has been the cultural element. What are people, how are people expressing themselves? What are they concerned about? What is their insight? What is their wisdom? And so on. And I remember taking a book with some of that along with me, uh, on this India trip, gave it to Secretary Clinton, and I mean, she read it and actually checked the footnotes. That really impressed me as a sort of scholar to check the footnotes. Uh, when she went to Latin America, I remember saying, "You must go and see Jorge Amado." Jorge Amado was a, a great. He was a great writer in Brazil. Almost got the Nobel Prize, I think. Has died now, but what, but I loved his literature. That was such an insight. Uh, if I were to go with somebody today who had a CIA briefing book. To Africa, let's say to Eastern Africa, I don't know how many of you know this, I would say, read the Song of the Week. It's a great poem by Okok Pitek. It's hard to get because I think he died without a copyright uh, being assigned. Uh, but it was one of the most beautiful and insightful poems. I guess it was written in the Acholi language. It was published by um, Heinemann. I've got, yeah, I've got copies, but I've had troubles getting copies. I mean, if you wanted to do it in a class, you might have to Xerox it, I guess. You don't think so? There's enough out there? So, th that, so that's not theater because sometimes theater is not as easily accessible. But it seems to me, it seems to me that's what's missing in our in our public policy or in our foreign affairs uh, world today. And I think it's missing sometimes because people don't realize that it's there and how important it is. And it's missing because the incentive, um, the incentives are maybe not there to to learn. In Ghana, years ago in Ghana, uh, when again when I was a public official, I arrived and. Uh, the cultural affairs officer was putting on an evening of um, the talking drum, which was a wonderful experience. I mean, I knew nothing, I knew nothing, I did not know what to expect. But you could hear the drums talking. And he said to me, you know, this isn't much appreciated sometimes by the embassy because you're, you're stepping out of the embassy bubble. He didn't use those words. And so I think we have a bit of a, of a dilemma here in our diplomatic service and perhaps even more broadly. And I'm not saying that's peculiar to the United States. I suspect it's true in many other uh, countries as well. But I just pose this as a problem. Theater and literature are ways of breaking through to get to know people when you, when you haven't had a chance to do it in any other way. But making that happen, and not just the sort of human rights theater, because I think that's important, but I think that doesn't take us to the deeper level unless within those expressions, the deeper level of life in these countries and among these peoples are there. So it's just the thought I've had um, and um, a dilemma that we face. But um, I leave it with you because I think you're probably all part of the solution to that dilemma. Thank you very much.
and having done two projects in the Congo with the U.S. Embassy, um, one of which was a month-long project where one of my dancers, who was so entranced by the country and got so involved in our first project, was invited back and did a full month with full embassy support, working with a hundred storytellers, musicians, dancers, and costumers, creating a dance that was embedded with the theme of ending gender violence. The whole idea was the, pro the brainstorm of the cultural affairs officer at the U.S. Embassy who had been living there with his family and just was overtaken with this, this problem in the country and thought, you know, people in the Congo communicate through dance, they communicate through song. If we can get Congolese to come together and create a new production that's based on this particular problem, then they can take it around the country, they can use UN planes and go to Goma and go to much smaller places and re-embed a new way of thinking through their own language. And um, you know, so what I'm hearing, I think it's the, maybe the theme of this entire conference about the disconnection between the State Department, the, the vehicles that might exist for people doing brilliant work and, and then taking it that much farther. Um, because, I mean, I've just been very lucky that Battery Dance Company has had these relationships and been able to go to these places um, and met really fine, talented, brilliant, visionary American Foreign Service officers. Not always, but occasionally. And this is a case in point. Right, I just heard from um, Austin Richardson in, um, in Chassel on Thursday. Uh, we've been working together since last year. And the person who's going there yeah. 